Ask the Messengers, the program that deals with substance abuse, real people telling real stories. Hosted by Pastor Lester Lewis, co-host Charlize Wilkerson and Leroy Carey. Produced by David Humphreys. Where there is addiction, there is a chance for recovery. We're trying to help save lives on Ask the Messengers. Today our topic is recovery. Today's special guest is Andre Johnson, President and CEO of Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. Plus, we'll talk about the opioid crisis and hear real stories from real people as they deal with real recovery. I realized that my son is about the age I was when I started using. I bought him. I used my money. I ain't stealing, breaking him, whatever. You know, I earned my money to take care of my my, um, habit. It's all here on this episode of Ask the Messengers. And now, here's your host, Pastor Lester Lewis. Hello, my name is Pastor Lester Lewis, and I am your host for Ask the Messengers. This show is all about real people sharing their real stories and to know that there is hope for those who may be struggling with addiction and also to share information with you that you may need to know. Uh, You may never, ever find yourself in a recovery program or uh, know where to go for information. Well, this is the show for you. Listen, today's show, today's guest is Andre Johnson, and he is the president and CEO of Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. And he's going to talk about what they do at their two locations. Now, he has an interesting story. Uh, he went from being an addict, from being a, 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 being a drug addict and high school dropout to being someone who is now well-respected in the recovery community as well as being a community leader. He's an inspiration to us all and uh, to those who seek recovery as well. Uh, He has a remarkable story and he's going to share it with us on today's show. Plus, you'll be hearing real stories from real people as Ask the Messengers hits the streets of Detroit. Call your friends and tell them to tune in. Don't miss today's show. Now, let's go to Ask the Messengers producer, David Humphreys, as he interviews and goes one-on-one with Andre Johnson, from Detroit Recovery Project. We're here with Ask the Messengers, Mr. Andre Johnson. He's the president and CEO of Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. How long have you been a part of Detroit Recovery Project? Uh, I'm actually the, one of the founders of this organization. Founded the program in the year uh, 2001. You founded it. So how many people did you bring on board to get it going? So at the time, um, wow, that's an interesting question. I may may have had between 10 and 15 people. Um, Probably a third of those people are no longer here. Um, Then I brought people from um, this guy named Dwight Ritchie. He worked at the Star Center, which is a a large methadone um, provider in this Detroit area, Um, Lawrence Kenyatta. Um, renowned prevention specialist in the Detroit area, um, Mr. Alan Bray, who's the CEO and a really, really good friend of mine and mentor to me who, who was over Share House at the time. He's now deceased. Dwight Ritchie is deceased. Um, and obviously a great Dr. Trent. Um, he actually provided the seed money to help our organization get started. And so when we first got started, we were a... Um, we, co- we refer to ourselves as a recovery committee. So as we had this recovery committee that consisted of individuals from prevention community, the treatment community, the recovery community, we had a good flavorful uh, group of people uh, that met on a monthly basis. It was at, We would average 10 to 15 people per month. And our strategy and our goals were to help people sustain long-term recovery. And so we used to do, uh, we decided we would do a relapse prevention series because we realized early on that when folks complete residential treatment, they need a support system that's in the community beyond the 28-day or 60-day treatment episode. They need somebody to help them to sustain their recovery. They need friends. They need opportunities. And so where we came in at is we began to develop and create networks for people like that. So what type of services do you offer today? So fast forward, uh, that committee was formulated in 2001. 
2005, we applied for a uh, 501c3, uh, our 501c3 application, and we were awarded July 5th, 2005, a 501c3 nonprofit status. So we've been an independent nonprofit organization since 2005. And as we um, launched the Detroit Recovery Project, it continued to evolve and morph into a program which we know now is recovery coaching. We pair people up with a recovery coach. And the recovery coach is like a cheerleader. It's the person that says, David, we're gonna help you on this journey. Recovery is a journey and it's not a destination. And part of that journey is really helping you to navigate through and down that journey. And so for example, um, imagine somebody said, David, you know, we want you to drive to Alaska. The first thing you're gonna try to figure out is how many hours is it gonna take to get there? How much gas is it gonna take? Is Do I have a reliable car? And what's the directions? And so part of the recovery coach is to really help you to be a driver, okay. to help you to avoid certain obstacles, to help you to avoid certain barriers so that you can continue down your journey of recovery. Now, looking at your background, you used to be a recovery coach at one time, didn't you? I'm a recoveryologist. Oh, so I, I, I try to recovery everything to everybody. All right. Uh, it's just a way of life for me. I am a person in long-term recovery, and what that means, I have not used no drugs or alcohol since July 13, 1988. Remember the date? Like it was yesterday. So let's talk about you. You were a pro parolee a fugitive, a high school dropout, and an addict, right? So tell us your story. Well, uh, you just, you, you said it, you summed it all up. Um, In that, detail. Yeah, you were very specific. But I'll tell you, um, I was, you know, for lack of better words, one of them young fellas that succumbed to the peer pressure of the community, the peer pressure of the neighborhood, wanted to be part of the in crowd, trying to be cool, hip, and, I paid a dear price for it, and thinking that I was going to be somebody. Um, I had a lot of false illusions. I had um, a lot of confidence in the guys that were on the streets. I was influenced by the guys that were on the streets. Growing up in, ninth, in the 70, late 70s, um, early 80s, and the glamorization of the Young Boys Incorporated, those were the guys who had became my and, and so when you have those type of idols, um, you begin down a, a, a path that, that there's no return for some people. Uh, and that's what happened to me. You know, I started off smoking weed and started selling weed. I started off selling cocaine and selling heroin, and I started snorting cocaine. I didn't get into the heroin. I was terrified of the heroin because I had seen what it had done to my uncles and family members in the 60s. We were talking about penny caps and tees and blues. So I was always immersed into this drug culture. And I knew a lot about, I knew more about drugs than I, I had learned in, in, in school. Uh, and so that led me down the path to the point where I went from smoking weed every day to snorting pot every day to smoking cocaine every day. And when the crack epidemic came out, I started smoking crack cocaine. And I hit a rock bottom quick. How did you stop? I stopped by the grace of God, a 12-step program, a parole office, probation officer, um, fear of going to penitentiary, um, and the willingness to do the right thing, and to be willing to do what I needed to do to get myself together. And that only happened because I was able to go to a residential treatment center and begin to really explore who I am and to find out that, yeah, I made a lot of bad decisions as a young man, but there was a whole life ahead of me and I had an opportunity to change that trajectory. But in order for that to happen, I had to be committed, I had to be dedicated, recovery had to be my number one primary purpose, and that's what it was. So it wasn't easy to, to, to quit, but you had, like you said, had to be committed. And I had a support system, so uh, I'm not gonna say it was hard. Uh, I think the hard part was, for me, was just the ability to um, do what I needed to do. You know, we have a saying, Winners do what they gotta do, and losers do what they wanna do. And I chose to be a winner. 
Now you're an icon in the, in the recovery business all over the country, respected highly, and you've connected yourself with other organizations. Are there any organizations that you could talk about that really uh, showed a lot of support along the way and is still with you? Well, um, one organization in particular, uh, Detroit Rescue Mission Ministry, I'm sure you've heard of them. Dr. Chad Audie, really, really good friend. Um, when we first launched the Detroit Recovery Project, he had given us space, office space, basically donated the office space to our organization uh, for several years at no cost. We had office space in Highland Park. We had a, a house uh, on East Grand Boulevard, one of those historical homes, three levels, and that became my first uh, recovery center. So when you have strong collaborations and relationships where people help you and work with you and don't don't expect nothing in return and never ever ask for anything, um, though that for me was a milestone uh, relationship. Obviously we were also, um, when we launched the Detroit Recovery Project, we were also very good friends to the city of Detroit. We were housed in the, in the Herman Kiefer uh, complex. Uh, so the, the health department, the entire Detroit City Council, the actual the, the mayor of Detroit at the time, uh, we got a lot of support and a lot of synergy from the county commissioners, the county executive office. Um, we had just support was coming from everywhere. So who was the mayor at the time? So at the time, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, he was the actual mayor for the city of Detroit. Uh, and so we, we were, we kind of blossomed um, during his tenure, um, during Ken Cockrell's tenure, um, and Dave Bean. All the ongoing mayors have been very supportive. Ken Cockrell, um, Dave Bean. Uh, and so when you have gov your local government supporting you, uh, it means a lot to the community and a lot of our growth and recognition had came from that. Because at one time, we used to tape our meetings at the city council, uh, in the city council chambers, uh, back in the early um, 2000s. And now, let's hear some real stories from those who sought recovery. Yes, I, I could have continued to use the heroin, but, not, but my, 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 my body, and I'm a religious, deeply religious person, and that would made me want to get off heroin because I, I'm, I'm a type of person that, okay, I hear you. I hear what your opinion, of, but your, your opinion of me at that point didn't matter as far as my drugs. You know, I, I, I bought them. I used my money. I ain't stealing, breaking them, whatever. You know, I earned my money to take care of my, my um, habit. But yes, it was having adverse effects on, on me because people stigmatize it and it caused me a couple of downfalls or, or, and I lost everything after my uh, second wife died. You know, I've been homeless. I was homeless for seven years going back and forth to treatment. But thanks be to God that I no longer have desire. I was hit by a car in September the 16th of last year. With mass, I sustained massive injuries. And I'm in pain, but 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 you know, of course I'll see I'll be a lying one if I tell you that 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 I don't have them urges and things of that to become addicted to the opiate uh, or heroin. You know, uh, I'd be crazy. And now at this stage, I, I I'm I'm studying to be a social worker to uh, for pediatrics, so I can stop it. Uh, so I can prevent. Or, uh, or help the young ones come up before they uh, reach these obstacles in life and to, uh, uh, to help them along. So they didn't have to bump their head or, or go through the uh, things that I went through. And for the ones who's using now, uh, the only thing I can tell a person my age, and especially a person in the black Afro-American community, is they need, to go, they need that church life in their life and a strong support group, you know, and be real with oneself, admit, because we, there's a lot of addicts out there, there's a lot of people out there that go to that methadone clinic every day. You know, they're functioning addicts, and they need, they, see, when you, when, you, when, when, when you are here now, you need to break the chain. You have to, you have to break the chain. That's methadone, whatever, you have to break. What motivated me to get help was, um, 
when I realized that my son is about the age I was when I started using um, to cope with not loving me correctly and knowing that if I am to continue down the path I was on, that is probably the path I'm going to guide him down. And um, I don't want that for him because I know how hard it was for me. We'll be right back with more of Ask the Messengers. Papillon Taylor offers tuxedo rentals, same-day prom wedding dresses, and mink leather alterations. Papillon Taylor also provides Audio organic jungle. dry cleaning and a convenient drive through pickup. Located on Southfield between 9 and 10 Mile Road, click Audio on papillontaylor.com or call 248-557-6699. Hi, I'm Ashley Greaser, the Office Manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2. Or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668. Hi, this is Pastor Lester Lewis, and I am your host for Ask the Messengers. Today's program, we've been talking with Andre Johnson, uh, President and CEO of Detroit Recovery Project, and he's been sharing so much information on uh, substance abuse and recovery. Now, coming up, Andre Johnson is going to be sharing and talking about opioids as a national epidemic. And he'll also talk about how he grew up walking past the weed and pill houses, uh, and it was a normal thing here in the streets of Detroit. Uh, as he travels through the, out the world, he's also going to share how he was, how he's been dealing with and helping people trying to get their lives back on track. We're back with Ask the Messengers with Andre Johnson, President and CEO of the Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. And Andre, it seems like the opioid use in, is in the media every day. They call it an epidemic. What is your take on that? Well, I think the truth is, um, you ever heard the term NIMBY? N-I-M-B-Y? No, I haven't. That stands for not in my backyard. Historically, uh, drugs were primarily in inner cities of America. Um, it's no longer just in the inner cities. You know, it's in the suburban communities. It's in the rural communities. And so what has happened is those communities have rallied together. Those communities have become the advocates. People are losing their lives. Unfortunately, I think op opioids have been around in the inner city as long as I can remember. I remember being in the fifth grade and walking down one street and they say, you know, that's the pill house. You know, that's where they got everything. But what happened is I think in inner cities in urban America, we'd be we normalize certain things, you know. Um, you know, I remember walking past the weed house going to my middle school. I remember walking past, you know, the prostitute going to my middle school. I remember walking past the pimp who had his head with the finger wave. So I think things that's normalized and, 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 and often um, we are traumatized in our community, other communities know how to combat and, and rally and pull and find resources to address the challenges that plague their community. I think we haven't done a real good job of that. Okay, let's talk about heroin in the 60s and 70s. What's the difference between heroin today? And well, those, those I, I think um, it's not much difference other than the fact that, you know, when I talk to my uncle and he tell me, you know, hey, you know, first time I had some heroin, it was a penny cap in 1961 or six, no, 66 or something like that as a young fellow in middle school. But I think the difference between the heroin back then and now is heroin wasn't being laced with carfentanil. It wasn't being laced with fentanyl. You know, carfentanil is like a elephant tranquilizer. Fentanyl is like 
Imagine fentanyl is is one of the most powerful morphine painkillers you can get. You know, it's usually prescribed for people who are like stage four cancer patients. So now they are lacing the fentanyl with the heroin, which means it's 10 times more potent than it was. And so you're putting yourself at a greater risk. And that's one of the reasons why it has become an epidemic, because more people are dying from drug overdose than in the history of our country. For a long time, it was predominantly a drug that killed primary, well not killed, but predominantly African Americans were the lion's share of overdose deaths. But now it's not just African Americans, it's America. And now it's an epidemic. Drug overdoses have become the leading cause of death of Americans under 50, with two thirds of those deaths from opioids. So we, we, we got to be able to, as professionals, to look past that, to look past the circumstances, and to be able to really embrace people and say, we're going to give this another try. And we're going to love you till you learn how to love yourself. And it's okay that you relapse. This is not the end of the world. You have an opportunity. I've seen people relapse after going through 10, 12, 13, 15, 16 treatment centers and remain drug free and become a totally different person. I've been straight for 29 years and I've seen them all. I mean, I'm talking about police officers, talking about lawyers, judges, physicians. It doesn't discriminate. No, it does not discriminate. It has nothing to do with age, <laughs> young people. It has nothing to do with your finance and how much money you got, celebrities. I mean, I've traveled the country and I have friends of all walks of life that are in recovery. Now you're talking about traveling. You've been traveling quite a bit lately. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you do on the road? Well, I do a lot of trainings, a lot of consulting. Um, throughout the country. Uh, do a lot of trainings here in the state of Michigan, helping other uh, parts of our region to uh, develop uh, recovery communities, uh, which is really, really important. Um, in the state of Michigan alone, we have a lot of overdose up in Marquette, Michigan, Muskegon, Michigan, the western part of the state, the northern part of the state. So I've been doing work with the state. I've also, uh, doing the President Obama administration, I was appointed to uh, by uh, the United States Secretary of Health and Human Service, Kathleen Sebelius, to serve on a board for three years. So I'll be uh, finishing up my third year uh, uh, as that appointment on the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration Board. And being on that board, um, it, it has definitely given me a lot of uh, national exposure. Um, and so I've had a lot of national exposure trainings and speaking all over the country. Uh, I was once on a project for in East Africa under the President Bush administration, helping to, to design and develop a recovery-oriented system of care, helping our brothers in the motherland on the uh, east continent of Africa and Tanzania. I spent a lot of time in Dar es Salaam, Zanzibar, Mombasa, Kenya. Uh, mm -hmm. I was on a five-year project uh, under President uh, Bush See, where I travel? I've traveled quite a bit, and I have friend, recovery friends all over the country. I can go to Prague, uh, Budapest, uh, Paris, Barcelona, you know, right, you name well, it. We, we've had, and that's the beauty of recovery is because for a long time, I was restricted to a two block radius. That was a liquor store, the vacant house, and the crack house. Stay tuned for more of Ask the Messengers. Hi, I'm Ashley Greaser, the Office Manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2, or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668. Papillon Taylor.
first Audio tuxedo jungle. rattles, same day prom wedding dresses, and mink leather alterations. Papillon Taylor also provides Audio organic jungle. dry cleaning and a convenient drive through pickup. Located on Southfield between 9 and 10 Mile Road, click Audio on papillontaylor.com or call 248-557-6699. success story. I mean, you're talking about you got off drugs, you got your GED, went to college, degree from Morehouse in Atlanta, and so you have to be an inspiration to a lot of people who think they can't do it. So tell us about, about that journey. Uh, so the, the journey of college is one of the beauties of recovery is we are, we emulate each other. We give each other hope. We embrace each other. We tell each other that you can do it, if I can do it. Uh, I really wasn't used to that type of um, support system. Um, so we have brothers in recovery of all walks of life who've completely changed their lives. And so if it had not been for brothers that saying, hey, uh, this is an opportunity uh, for you to change, this is an opportunity for you to better yourself. Um, I was used to people saying, here's a sack, uh, here's a half a key on consignment. Uh, bring me that money by the first. Um, that that lifestyle that I was once immersed in, I had to really change it. And I had to overcome a lot of fear of failure. I had to really work on my spirituality, meaning that I really had to work on my faith. And I really had to have some belief that I can envision myself doing what, I, what it is that I want to do. Between 400 to 500 people visit Detroit Recovery Project's two locations in Detroit per month. Thank you so much for watching today's show. Our guest, Andre Johnston, President and CEO uh, from Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated and he shared today about the opioid epidemic uh, as well as uh, those who are struggling with, with, with addiction, uh, but also with, more importantly, with recovery. And that's really what this is all about, about helping people to find that place of recovery. And so it is our prayer that you would find a God of your own understanding that would help you through and get you to that place of recovery. I'm Ashley Greaser, the Office Manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2, or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668.